We're starting a new sermon series today. We finished talking about all the distractions. Who feels that that impacted your life, talking about distractions? It was very valuable. Good, I'm happy to hear that. It's a little bit different for me to uh, have that lecture series because I typically preach on a topic and now I'm back in more in my comfort zone today. I'll be preaching through a book, and it may take a while, but I hope that you will stay with me because there's a lot of richness that we can glean from the Word of God, and I'm excited for this new sermon series. We're going to start the book of Romans. As I look through, it has... 16 chapters. Mark, you're going to preach through all 16 chapters? Yes, I will. And today, when we, I start a new topic or with a book, I start with a little bit of introduction and background. The point will be the first chapter of Romans. Who wrote the book? And give us all of that information. And it gives us a clue as to where we're headed to the point of the book. And then we'll see more as we go on. I enjoy the book of Romans. And I've preached on it, but it's been quite some time. And now I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and Go again. Oh, excuse me. This is the first time I've preached through the book of Romans. And I'm very excited to share with you. And I hope you will be excited to see what's coming forth from the word of God. It is so rich and deep. Maybe you prefer someone to preach something simple and surface. Well, maybe then you need to look for another church that preaches just a surface taste. You know, in the mountains. But me, I like to go for the depth of God. Amen. It is not going to be easy and simple. I want you, the deaf and hearing alike. I want you to understand the depth and knowledge of God's word. Amen. It is very rich, and I want to share it with you all. <coughs> Let's open it with prayer. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. Lord, as we go through the book of Romans, I pray, number one, that you would convict our hearts. And number two, that you would show us the truth of your word. And number three, to give us the opportunity to change our lives, to be conformed more to your will and how you made us for you, Lord. Oh, that song that was just recently done, Christine, the beautiful conformity and fit with you. That was so beautiful to see this morning. Lord, I pray that you will help us to read Romans and go through it and conform to your will. Prepare our hearts now, Lord, as we think about your word and then glean understanding. See uh, where the book is coming from and how that point can impact me today. Yes, it was written about 2,000 years ago. Can it really impact me today, people might be saying? How do I apply it to my life today? Oh, Lord, I pray that I will be clear. Give us all eyes clear to see your word and understand the signs and the voice interpretation. To see the richness from your Lord and to understand and apply it to our lives today. I thank you for all these things. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Anytime I start a book like the book of Romans... I look for when it was written, where it 
took place, who wrote it, what was the point of writing it, what's the real meaning behind those words. And I want to share with you today an introduction to the book. It's right there, <laughs> written in the book, so I don't have to invent anything. It is right there for us to glean. Okay, now I'm going to give you a new memory verse to focus on. Hebrews chapter 12, 1. Now it's going to be new. So we're going to be practicing it for four and five weeks, and then I'm going to give you a new one through the book of Romans. Just a few memory verses in the book of Romans, but oh, they are so many we could choose from. They are rich and very deep, scripturally sound messages to us. And I hope that you will take the challenge of memorizing this verse. Romans 1, verse 16. I'm going to show you the verse. We'll read it together. I'll sign it, and I'll give you a moment to meditate on it. And we will discuss this verse in the preaching today as well. So this is how I sign the sign for the biblical book of Romans. Chapter 1, verse 16. All together. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Good job. Watch me first as I sign the verse. And then we will sign it together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The word Greek here... Um, why? I don't understand why it's there. This wasn't written to the country of Greece. So, why did they choose to put the word Greek there? It means you and I write. Someone who is not a Jew. Another word for that is Gentile. You've heard that word before? Gentile? The sign I used is the same, yes, Gentile or Greek. Because the translation means the same thing. To the Jew first and to the Gentile and the Greek after. I'm going to sign it again and then we'll practice together. Not yet. Hold on, everyone. Watch me first. Watch me first. Romans 1, chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. We good? Let's all do it together. Sign with me. Romans chapter 1. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Was that clear? Who will practice? Who will commit to practicing for this week? Several of you. I didn't say memorize. Who will practice? Good for you. Thank you very much for showing me you will. And I'm going to see who's going to be willing to comment and share next week. You already know it, Malachi? 
Are, uh, you have the signs down, Pat? No. Uh, you better practice th this week, okay? Uh, uh, no spelling allowed. You need to sign it, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Before we start the message today, I'm thinking about Romans chapter 1 and the background information I would like to share with you. The first question, in my mind, would be, who wrote the book? Who wrote Romans? Maybe you're interested in looking and checking and other people want to discuss who is the author of the book of Romans? And you're asking, why? Well, you're not sure. It could be these people. But the book of Romans says itself, yeah. chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Immediately, we know that Paul wrote the book. There's no doubt, no question. It's very clear and similar style of Paul's writing. We know Paul spoke this book and had someone writing it down for him. And we know that it comes from Paul. Sometimes in other letters, Paul, he'll say Paul and Timothy and several other, okay? But right now, it says Paul. As a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Any questions? No. Did... The Romans know who Paul was. No. No. They didn't know who Paul was. Paul traveled extensively. But he never traveled to Rome. Well, not yet anyway. He'll get there soon. But the people in Rome didn't know who Paul was. So he introduces himself. I am a Paul. I am Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. I see a lot of no, uh, blank looks out there. Oh, you didn't say Paul is a servant of God. He said he's a servant of Jesus Christ. There's a difference. You might ask me, there is a difference? Yes, and I will explain soon. A servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. The word apostle means sent one for Jesus Christ. Like the idea of an, a missionary. Who wrote the book? Paul. Good job. A plus. <laughs> and this is his name sign because he traveled. Some will say use this sign, but I, I prefer to use Paul as in traveling. Now, number two, the second question would be why did he write it? Why did he write the book of Romans? Many of Paul's letters are written to encourage a church. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, all of those letters are written by Paul. Specifically to encourage and to help the believers in the church. All of Paul's writings are almost all are for encouraging the church. And that makes sense. 
So now Paul is writing to the Romans, and why is he writing to Romans? <laughs> uh, no, I fooled you. <laughs> so Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, and called to be an apostle, apostle, excuse me, separated, what? Unto the gospel of God. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning who? His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. If you live during the Roman times and you read that paragraph, would you understand? Jews who lived in Rome would understand some of it. But what about the Roman citizens themselves? Would they understand? No. And I'll explain a little bit more as we go along. But right now, Paul is giving reasons for the letter. So far we see the reason of the letter is the gospel of God. And the gospel of God is concerning his son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. And it relates to his lineage, the seed of David, according to the flesh. And declaring to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. So already we see all of the goal, the content of the gospel. God in the flesh. He came to earth, he died, he was buried, and rose again. He has already that. We already have the complete gospel right there in this paragraph. But Romans not going to accept that. Why not? I'll continue to explain. In verse 5, by whom, who is the whom? They're referring to. He is referring to Jesus. We have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom also ye are called of Jesus Christ. Now Paul is writing to some of the people in Rome. No, you tell me I'm wrong. No, not some. You see the word all. To he is writing to all the people in Rome who are beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul introduces himself. This is who I am. And he tells why he's writing the letter. So I ask you, why did Paul write the letter? He wasn't writing to the church. To all the Romans for the gospel. My go Paul's goal is to write the letter to share the gospel with everyone who is living there in Rome. 
So Paul is saying, I want to share the gospel with you. Do they have a church there in Rome? Not yet. Paul is getting their attention and say, you in Rome, same as the other places, are called to be Christians, called to be saints of God, called for salvation. I want to share this good news with you. Paul is excited to share the gospel with the Romans. Now our third question. Paul wrote the book to share the gospel and to whom? To all the people who live in Rome. He just recently said it. All of those who are living in Rome. Now, who lives in Rome? Tell me. Gentiles, specifically. Romans. Jews. Greeks. And others. We're going to see another word. Barbarians. So who are barbarians? We think, you know, like caveman type people with a spear and they grunt a lot. No, no, no. That isn't what the word means. The word barbarian means not Roman, not a Gentile, Greek. And they're not Jews. It means they're from other countries in the area. And Romans considered those people inferior to themselves. The problem with the people living in Rome, oh, here's a picture of the Roman Empire. Where's Rome specifically? Right there. But Rome owned all of the areas in red, including Israel. Israel was under Roman control at this time. And Paul is writing this letter to all of the areas that Rome controlled, as well as those all in Rome. The problem with people who live in Rome is what? And it's explained in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Hmm. Faith? What, what is he talking about, your faith? I thought he was talking to people who were unsaved. Why does he include this word faith? They have faith. But they have faith in what? Many gods. Apollo, Juno, Hercules, Diana, the list goes on and on. <coughs> they had over 12 core gods, but they had many more than that 12. Hundreds and hundreds 
of little gods and god esses many now paul says i praise you because you have faith you believe in something way to go does he stop there is that enough no Paul says I've heard throughout the whole world about Roman belief and is very similar and bound with Greek beliefs as well Zeus Apollo and many others <coughs> so as these two countries have these similar beliefs Paul he says I am writing about another God that you can add to the list add one more Jesus is that his point I ask you <coughs> No, that is not what Paul wants. Paul wants them to understand your list of so many gods doesn't work. And then he explains to them why it doesn't work. Paul says, I've heard that you have faith. Good job. You believe in something. When did Paul write this? After Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected, yes. It's not yet 70 AD, it's before that. And how do we know when Paul wrote this? Well, let's look in the Bible. Do you agree? Good. So in verse 9, Paul says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. So I ask you, Paul prayed often for people in Rome? Why? Yes, he was burdened for the people of Rome. He had a heavy burden on his heart for the Romans because at that time, it was the capital of the world and had great power. And Paul wanted to share the gospel there. In verse 10, he says, making a request. If by any means now that I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. So that means Paul has not yet been there. He is writing the letter ahead. And say, I'm not there yet, but I believe I will come. But I haven't yet. Now, verse 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you. But was let hitherto. Hmm, what does that phrase mean? Allow? It means the opposite of allow. It means blocked, prevented. He wanted to go, but there were so many things that blocked his plans to go. And now Paul can't go. Why can't Paul go now? She thinks jail 
And I agree with her. And I believe Paul wrote this during his time in jail in Israel. If you were here on Wednesday night, I've been preaching through the book of Acts. And remember, Paul arrived to Jerusalem to worship. And what happened? A great chaos happened and he was arrested. It was discussed in the council and the council says, better take him to the governor in Felix, who's named Felix, and let him listen to the situation. And then, here we pick it up here, and when Felix heard these things, he is the chief soldier there. And when he comes, I will know the answer for you. And he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty, that, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to come and minister to him. So basically, Paul is under house arrest. You know, like he had an ankle bracelet. And it would beep if he walked too far outside. No, I'm kidding. It wasn't that form of house arrest. But it's that same concept there. He can read, he can write, and he can have visitors. But he has to stay there. And Paul lets them know, I'm stuck in Israel waiting for Felix to decide. How long does he stay there? Do you remember? Two years. Good job, CJ. You know, Felix is hoping for money, a bribe to get Paul out. But after two years, Felix Festus he left him bound for over two years. And Paul is there just waiting and waiting for a trial. Paul knows he will go to Rome because God himself had told him he would go. Okay, Lord, when... I can't go right now, so I'll write a letter. Paul writes a letter ahead of time, about 57 AD or 58. Paul's right here under house arrest. He will travel to Rome, but he hasn't yet. So this is a rough estimate of A.D. 57 or 58. What is his true purpose? We know to share the gospel. But the real deep meaning? You mean there's more than that? Oh, yes. You will see. Romans 1.11 that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you, ye, may be established. That I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both you and me, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor to both the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me is what I want to do, I am ready to preach the gospel to you. My goal 
is to preach the gospel to the Jews, to the Romans, to the Greeks, and all others. I want all of you to know the gospel. I want to share it with all of you because my heart is so heavily burdened for you. So I ask you, do we have the same burden today? I wonder. We should. And you say, Paul can't hold this. And he tells me, you know, be patient. I'm going to get there. I can't go right now. I mean, I can't hold it anymore. I am ready and I want to share the gospel now. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time who I am and that I'm going to preach to you. I want you to be saved. So that is the deep, real purpose. Paul wants all to be converted to Christianity. To the Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, and anyone else there. Paul says, I want to preach. And then we hit verse 16. And that is our memory verse. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed either. I'm going to share. I'm not quaking in my boots. Uh, sh should I say something now? Oh, biting my nails? No. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? He has already given me power. The power of salvation. I am a Christian. Do you have that power of salvation? You tell me, oh yes, work. Mark, I, I've been saved. Then who are you sharing it with? Have you shared to others? Where is this power? The power of God unto salvation. To those who are called the elect only who can be saved. Is that what the verse says? To the elect only? <laughs> CJ's looking ready. Uh, 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 no. Uh, what? Tell me the answer. Tell me the answer. Is that what it says? To everyone that believeth. Y'all, pay attention. The gospel is offered to all. And all are called. Come on. God beckons us all. It's there. It's simple. Yes or no, will you take it? Paul says the salvation of God is offered to all who believe. To the Jew first, yes. Paul's very clear. We stand on the book of Acts and we travel and show up. And right there, first, always, he goes to a synagogue and tells the Jews there, the Messiah is here. Hey, guys, did you know this? The Messiah is already here. He's come. The Messiah is here. And some Jews accept the information and become saved. And Paul says, all right, now let me tell you the gospel to others who don't know who the Messiah is, who don't know the God of the Bible. I'm going to give you the news, the news, excuse me. Jesus Christ came from heaven. He on earth and walked he was crucified he was buried and he rose again and that is what I preach Paul says now we come to maybe the most important verse of the whole book because now
Paul has set up the next paragraph, starting with verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith because it is written as it is written. What does this mean? It is pulled from the Old Testament. It's quoted from the Old Testament. As it is written, the just, and this is a sign I use for just, it's almost the same word as righteousness. It's the same concept, really. The just shall live by faith. Now, do the Romans have faith? Oh, yes, they do. A whole list of things they have faith in. And they believe in their gods and goddesses. They have faith. Do Romans have righteousness? I ask again. Do Romans have righteousness? No. We will see the answer to that question next week. No. 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 I'm watching everyone's no. reaction in the audience. This is the truth. I'm going to save it for next week. <laughs> I've got this, okay? First of all, it's very important. As it is written, because the direct quote now, where is this quote from? I see many of you answering. Yes. The just shall live by faith. Is quoted from the book of Habakkuk. Chapter 2. Hold for a moment. I want to give you a short explanation about Habakkuk. It's one of the prophets of the Old Testament. And he was a man and one of the few Jews left. And he sits in the town looking for God. And says, God, why did you leave us here? What is wrong? And God answers him and talks with Habakkuk. It's a very interesting book. God also talks about, about the Babylonians and others there. But Habakkuk is sitting in the tower watching and waiting and asking, Where are you, God? And he says, I will stand on my watch. And set me on the tower and will watch to see what God will say to me and what I will answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, write down the vision and make it plain upon, you know, not paper, but the tablets that he wrote on that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet to be for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it will tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. He's talking about Israel. Israel is not doing right. Israel is, 
proud and not right with me. But today we have this part of the quote, but the just shall live by his faith. God is telling Habakkuk, those who are in Israel, who are righteously living, and keep on, even though there are so many problems and chaos around, keep going. And I will show you through your faith. That's the point of Habakkuk. But he quotes this portion in the New Testament three times. Three different meanings with the same quote, and it's very interesting. The first time he uses it in the book of Romans, we're going to talk a moment, and the second time he uses it in the book of Galatians. For as many as are written of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The point of the book of Galatians, the law can't save you. It requires living by faith. And the law is not, notice this word, live. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So Galatians is describing what life looks like. A life of faith looks like. And that is the focus of the book of Galatians, the living part. The other time he used it in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he, God, is faithful that promised. Later, yet for a little while, and he will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. We see it quoted again. <clears throat> but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. So this focus here is on the word faith. And that is why it was quoted, to describe what faith looks like. So Galatians focuses on living, and Hebrews focuses on the faith part of the quote. Romans focuses on what? Look at the whole phrase, the just shall live by faith. Galatians focused on shall live, the living part. Hebrews focused on the by faith. So Romans is focused on what? The just. The just. So what is the meaning of the just? No, not this sign. The just. Paul is writing ahead to people in Rome and telling them the just shall live by faith. You have faith. You have faith. I, Paul, have a focus on the just and righteousness. And so Paul's point, he's telling them, you 
have religion. You are religious. But, but you're not righteous or just. So Paul is using as a springboard to talk to more about them later. We are going to discuss this more next week, how you and I, in verse 1 through 16, and the application for us today, number one, Jesus has called you to be saints. Maybe you're here today and you say, I know who Jesus is. I know God. And I believe. Now, God called you to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Saints. And I pray and I encourage you, if you have not yet trusted Jesus Christ and put your faith in him as a savior, I pray that you will decide to do this today. That's number one. Number two, belief in God is not enough. The Roman people had belief in gods, little g, in many of them. And Paul says, that's not enough. It's religious and you have a religion, but you don't have righteousness. You are not just. Number three, the gospel of Christ Bring salvation to the believers. Not by works, not by service, not by doing. My salvation comes through Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen. 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 Number four, you, all of you, are not just or righteous without salvation. I meet so many people and I have opportunity to do funerals for the hearing conversation because they don't have a pastor and they pick me and say, can you come do this funeral? I sit and want to talk with the family ahead of time. Many of them say, oh, that person was a good man, a good person. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, ugh, no, he was not. That person was not a good person. And why would I say or think this? No one is a good person. No one. Even me, Mark, as a pastor, <clears throat> I'm a good person. And I teach my kids as a coach, and I coach them and get involved with my family. And I'm faithful to my wife, and I don't cheat. And I give a tie to the church, and I go to church faithfully. I'm involved in church ministries. I witness and share to other people often. I do all of these things. And that means I'm a good person? No, it does not. It doesn't matter what I do. I do work, but that nev doing that work will never be called good in God's eyes. Never. The Bible clearly tells us our works are to him as filthy rags. Other people may call them good. You know, it's more like a dirty diaper to the Lord. God looks at that and says, ugh, no thanks. This is disgusting. You are not a good person. 
without salvation. It doesn't matter what you do, what you say, you still have sin. And we're going to discuss this more next week. I'm going to close in prayer. And I hope you think, and I'm going to add one more challenge for you. Is the gospel true? It is. I encourage you to do the same as Paul and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I ask you, pray, oh Lord, help us. Help me not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Help me to be like Paul, to be willing and bold to write and preach to other people. And I encourage you all to copy that behavior. Our Father in Heaven, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for coming to earth. He was fully God and fully man. Oh Lord, I pray that you will give me courage to share your word. The gospel of God related to his son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth, lived and died on the cross for my sins. Lord, thank you. Not, you are not just another religion. You believe different because you make a change in the believer. Bless us now, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand. Maybe something.